Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor and I'm your host for episode 22 here in early part of, actually mid part of December. As I said on my last show, I was going to be away for a couple of weeks, so sorry for a bit of the gap in the show as I was traveling to the UK to visit my friends um, out there, some fellow EV YouTubers by the names of James, Co James Coates from Kate and James, or James and Kate, uh, EV Nick or Nick Ramos, and Jonathan Porterfield from ecocars.net and had a great time recording a show unfortunately the video <clears throat> didn't turn out very good I had some low light issues so I took the audio and put that into the last podcast that just went up recently so hopefully you were able to listen to that and enjoy that and I thank again my brotherhood of EV YouTubers out in the UK for joining me and having a good chat about things that are going on in the EV world. So let me get into today's episode. I have a tad of a cold after all these trips, so I'm going to try to get through it without coughing too much, hopefully, today. So let's get right into it. Now, my first story, I think, is timely, um, just with the very much of the end of the uh, United Nations UN uh, climate conference that's going on and that's wrapping up in Poland over the last couple of weeks. There's been a lot of information coming out. <clears throat> and I think from the coverage that I've seen, I think it really has been a wake-up call for the planet and for most major governments of most countries. Um, this report that I pulled out before or just, just during the conference a few days ago um, talked about that the current targets put us on track for about a 3% uh, Celsius, a degree of global warming, by the year 2100, which is 80 years away, not that far in reality. Uh, so we're on a path to a three percent warm three three sorry degree Celsius uh, warming uh, by that, which is twice the limit that was agreed on through the Paris Accords and the Paris Summit three years ago. So obviously <laughs> that's an indication that the countries aren't doing so well. We've already doubled what we thought the target was going to be. The goal was going to be at one and a half degrees C, and we're already tracking for three degrees C within the same time. So obviously we're not doing enough. And this report by Climate Action Trackers, it was an annual update that they did for the, the climate change talks that happened in Poland. So, you know, they say that the current warming in 2018 has already reached one degree C, and that's in a very short time, and is again, a global warming number. Um, so even though that the, the pledges are leading us to a 3%, uh, 3 degree C warming uh, over the, uh, the time frames that were pledged, the actual policies in place that governments have adopted in the world is, is implementing is actually tracking us to go beyond that, to warm, uh, warm more to 3.3 degrees C by 2100. So what all this means is that we're not on track. What was identified in the Paris Accords are not being met. M most major governments, there's only very few that are actually role models for the world as far as climate change and what they're doing to tackle climate change. Uh, the vast majority of the industrialized world and modern world are, are not even close to, to achieving those targets. Uh, and that's, of course, a shame, and I've talked about that before. So now it's still possible to keep that warming down to one and a half degree. Um, time frames or to slow the warming down uh, if we put into practice um, the, the, the recommendations that were made basically instead of just all talk and no action. It's as simple as that. So there, there are some governments that have really delayed their progress and the ones that stand out are Australia, Brazil, Indonesia, Russia, UAE and the US. Um, and of course, these countries, especially if you look at the U.S., are really starting to see the impacts of climate change. You can't really hide that fact. Whether you believe in climate change or not, the fact that weather systems are getting more severe and impacts are getting more severe, it's there in the news, right? Just look at the daily news for a week by week. Um, you know, our changing climate, I mean, I've got this other report that I'm referencing here. Um, that talks about if we don't do anything that we could see a five degree C uh, increase in, temp in global temperatures by the end of the century, which is, um, you know, compared to pre-industrial temperatures. So in the last 150 years, you know, it's a huge, huge difference. And it's not only about warming and acidifying oceans um, that there are uh, impacts to, of course, that contributes to rising sea levels. 
Uh, and if we look at the U.S., as I just mentioned, uh, the increase in, in average temperatures in the U.S., the, per, the amount of precipitation that's changing, either too dry or too wet. Look at the California wildfires this year as an, as an observation. They were the worst in its state's history, from my understanding. You know, and the impact of these on, on, on our environments and on our cities and countries uh, for the long term can be relatively very significant. So it looks like, though, um, after I read this report and then, of course, I watched some of the climate change uh, going on in Poland, Another they wrapped up. The good news out of that is that there was a general, a new agreement to fulfill the promises of the Paris Agreement from a few years ago by uh, reporting on and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. There were some arguments about what do you report and, and how do you scale that, but the intent there it seems to be putting everything back on track, um, and that was also that was agreed on by 196 countries, including the U.S. So there still is hope, folks. And as I mentioned on many shows prior to this and when i talk to people part of what i do the real reason of what i do here in front of the camera and public outreach and talking to people and just trying to live my life the same way i'm not perfect but trying to lead a little bit by example is to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions is is to try to you know help what we can do for the environment this is something that we can personally as consumers have a direct impact on yeah we can turn down our lights we can put things on timers try to use less electricity but when you're like if you're in a, an area like ontario here where electricity is generally clean and we have in a lot of cases an overabundance of it especially in quebec as an example then these things really don't do much to affect climate change driving a vehicle with a, with a zero tailpipe with no tailpipe and a zero emission can make a difference and you know i talked in the last show especially in the audio podcast about wheel to well and we've gone through that so i'm not going to get into that today but that's something that directly you and i and and as people interested in electric vehicles are and, and, and interested in trying to do something to help save our planet beyond recycling and, and all this kind of stuff and you know you can debate meat and vegan and all this other stuff that's going on i'm not going to get into that i'm, I'm strictly t- uh, talking about this topic but this is something that we have a direct control over and if it and if it can if electrification can fit into your life into your lifestyle i know it doesn't work for everybody and i get that and i don't condemn you if you drive a pickup truck or an suv that's not what i'm here to do i'm just here to educate and help and let you know what's going on in the world that maybe at some point there may be an opportunity for you in your lifestyle for for what your needs are to convert to electrification and to eventually get rid of a tailpipe and that's what i'm all about so it's good to see that uh, countries have finally realigned, and the U.S., even with, with President Trump's rhetoric uh, about not believing in global climate change and all this kind of stuff, it seems that the U.S. is pretty serious in getting involved in this. So that's great news. Uh, let's hope that this continues and this ball starts rolling, and, and as I've mentioned prior and prior, that it rolls faster and faster so that we can make more of a direct impact on climate change for the better sooner. Now, on that note, fuel re- re- realtors, I mean, retailers, excuse me, oil and gas companies, that kind of stuff. I've mentioned in some other shows that some of them are looking at electrification. I mean, they can't, you can't ignore what's going on in the world. If you're a Shell or a BP or a Texaco or whatever, all these big conglomerates, you just can't put your head under the sand and, and ignore what's going on from an electrification standpoint and what's going on with oil and gas in general and the harm that it's doing for our planet. So there's a report that just came out, an article that uh, says that uh, 50% of, uh, or fuel retailers are recognizing that about 50% of global car sales are going to be EV friendly by the year 2033. So they finally come out and say, you know what, we do see this trend happening. (laughs) Maybe we better do something about it. And I've talked about this in the past that some companies like BP and Shell and others, um, uh, Equinor is another one, which is formerly Stat Oil and Total, I believe, in the UK and also in the US, Chevron and ExxonMobil, are all looking now to do some sort of uh, coexistence from an oil and gas infrastructure and an electric vehicle infrastructure. And that's good news. That means that some of them have already started to adopt deploying EV chargers within their service centers, and some of them are looking to do that. Um, so they recognize that the growth of, of EVs signals real progress in reducing carbon emissions globally. And that's something, of course, we've been talking about for a long time. And to overcome the challenges facing the industry, the development of EVs and associated infrastructure needs to go only from policy driven to actually market driven. So 
you could talk all you want about stuff and you know all governments go through this but in, but until you actually deploy and, and do something about it it's just all rhetoric it's just all talk so we do need more things done so it seems like conventional fuel retailers are going to step up and look at deploying even more strategic strategically located fuel points uh, in urban and suburban, suburban areas and looking into adopting electrification or recharging elements there. So let's see what happens, but that's good news that we're starting again. We're, you know, it's a big, big giant ship that needs to turn and it, it takes a long time to turn that boat around. And uh, it looks like some of the attention is finally being recognized by the big oil and that they're looking to step in and, and get into this game. So uh, we'll wait and see what happens. Now, on that note about charging stations, and I mentioned Total earlier, Total, which is actually a French big oil company, pardon me, not a UK one, um, they've announced that they're going to install eventually, so no time frame eventually can mean a lot, up to 1,150 kilowatt fast chargers in Europe. Um, they are consolidating its position as a key player in electric mobility. So again, they've recognized the needs and the market where it's going, and they want to play in there. They also are, are committing to building, expanding a fast charging network. So in September of, of, of this year, uh, sorry, of, uh, yeah, this year, 2018, Total acquired a French company called G2 Mobility. And G2 Mobility manages about 10,000 charging points already um, in parts of Europe. And uh, they want to expand the partnership with them between Total Gas and Power and ChargePoint in the UK as well, bringing these guys in. So uh, again, to install about up to 1,000 um, DC fast chargers, 150 kilowatts each at its 300 service stations. They want to do about one every 150 kilometers or so. Um, and they want to do about three chargers on average per station. So 300 stations, about three chargers per station. You do the math and add that up. Again, good news that more big oil is getting into the electrification game. And here's proof that uh, one company is recognizing that and jumping on the bandwagon sooner than some others. Last couple of shows talked a lot about the LA Auto Show, which is which was going on over the last few weeks and reports coming out from there. And there's old, old stuff I'm still going through. But one of them was Nissan's. Some of the announcements that came out during that time frame, especially their V to G or vehicle to grid and grid to vehicle type systems or what they call their electric vehicle ecosystem uh, strategy. Now, Nissan has been a bit of a forefront, similar to Tesla. I mean, Tesla's got the power walls and they've got a strategy there, but it's different from Nissan where the vehicles are actually an integral part of the system, not just the energy storage platform, uh, which is what a power wall is. Um, but that the and they've talked about the vehicle to grid for quite some time, but now they're really kind of hone, honing that in and they're calling it Nissan Energy. And what that means is that a Nissan will offer owners of uh, Nissan's electric vehicles the ability to easily connect their cars with energy systems that'll charge their cars, that'll power homes and businesses and or feed energy back to power grid. So you could get a minus kind of situation going, a credit situation going on your power grids in some instance, instances. And also they're going to further the upscale and the uptake of uh, developing new ways to reuse electric car batteries. And that's a topic I've, I've spoken with with many people that are concerned about the proliferation of electric cars and what's all these batteries. I mean, after five, six, seven, eight, ten years, what's going to happen with them? I mean, we're going to do more harm maybe to the planet than good, but there's a lot of recycling and reuse applications that are being looked at and put forward to. And Nissan has been pretty good at looking to reuse old leaf batteries, as an example, in other systems, uh, and specifically these these power energy systems. So they they bring Nissan brings this concept together under their intelligent mobility strategy banner, uh, and I talked about that on previous shows. So. Here's a couple of examples of what they mean by what, what you could you could envision their strategy and how it would work in real life. So in Franklin, Tennessee, Nissan North America is piloting the use of LEAF vehicles to assist in, in powering its headquarters facilities during peak electrical demand times, um, anticipating some cost savings. So there's an immediate ROI strategy where, hey, when the, the electricity is at its most expensive time, let's cut some of that feed from the outside grid and let's power some of our, our offices and business environments from cars because we have all these batteries here that are sitting in these vehicles and let's uh, save some money there, you know, in fleet vehicles as an example of which they own. Good use of that. These are just a few concepts and I, I applaud Nissan for, uh, for continuing with that strategy and others are doing it. Of course, Tesla has a similar strategy in what they're doing for power elements and other companies are getting involved with it as well.
Continuing on with Nissan, just a quick update. Now, if you not didn't know this, Nissan's had this program, what they call No Charge to Charge. It's been running for a couple of years. It's a U.S.-based program, unfortunately, not here in Canada or other countries that I'm aware of, but certainly not here in Canada. And we don't hear a lot about it because it's just something they offer their U.S.-based customers. And it's a promotion that basically means that when you purchase or lease a Nissan Leaf for the first two years, you get free AC and DC charging um, from participating charging networks. And they've got partnerships in various areas where you can plug in for free and charge. Um, as a cost saving, that's pretty cool. I mean, if, especially if you're going to do some long road trips um, or do some traveling around the, the state or the area, uh, DC fast charging, can, the cost can start wrapping up the more you do. So it's a nice little program. And what they've come out with this in this recent article is that they're going to expand that to Hawaii. Now, granted, Hawaii is not a huge state. It doesn't take long to drive around the island, uh, some of the islands, but it's a nice gesture to, to bring in that state into the fold as well and to add it to the... Uh, no charge to charge program. Um, again, this program was launched in 2015, and, and that's you know pretty similar to. I mean, Tesla started in 2012 with the super, with their Model S and brought up the supercharger network, and Nissan. Instead of building a network, said, "Look, we're just going to help pay to first some costs for the first couple of years to get people." over the range anxiety hump and to get them to using their electric vehicles as much as they would want to for a, a nice vehicle uh, as a replacement. So it's a good strategy. Um, currently, the promotion provides uh, over uh, about covers about 55 markets across the U.S. and it's accessible to about 93% of U.S. LEAF owners. So that's a pretty good stat. My hat's off again to Nissan for having some forward thinking uh, in their whole uh, electrification strategy, which sometimes goes missed. Um, people don't see that. They don't. They just think of other things about Nissan, rapid gated, whatever. And it's like, look, there's a lot of other things Nissan's doing here with their ecosystem. They're pretty serious about electrification, and I hope they continue with that. Um, so good that uh, that they're continuing with the, at least the no charge to charge program, and hopefully they expand it even further. Now, one vehicle I've talked a lot about almost on every successive show for the past few is the Hyundai Kona. And I'm not going to you know, get into stats and all this kind of stuff. It's just one article that popped out recently about U.S. pricing. We've been seeing some U some European pricing because that's where it's been going on sale. And I know there's reservations in Canada and stuff, but I haven't seen any confirmed pricing here in Canada. But this uh, article talked about uh, confirmed pricing now for U.S. Kona. And the 64 kilowatt hour version will cost uh, as a base trim level, I guess, price of $36,450 US, that's USD. Now, take away the $7,500 federal tax credit if you qualify for that as much. Again, not everybody will qualify for that or get that full amount. But if you do, now that price is down to excuse me, just under 29,000 US, 28,950. And of course, many states also offer additional incentives for electrification and for buying EVs in California with, with one of the best incentives. If you were to buy one of those in California, your price can get down another 2,500 bucks to about 26,450. 26,450 for a 64 kilowatt, pretty cool, pretty nicely equipped Hyundai Kona. Uh, Hyundai Kona. Um, man, that is a good, good price. Uh, cost parity is, you know, almost there with something like that because it, you know, it is a smaller SUV, more like a CUV type vehicle. So it's not huge, huge. Uh, the Nero, of course, as I've talked about on many shows is bigger, but with, you know, with an EPA range of over 250 miles to 50 to 60 miles, um, you know, doing the, the dollar for, you know, bang for the buck scenario on that, that's a pretty compelling, compelling uh, argument to make and, and a good, good reason to look at the Kona as if you're looking at a vehicle as a first all electric vehicle, that could be the one to get into, especially at those kind of price points. Will it affect other EV sales? Um, this article is kind of contemplating, will it affect Bolt and, and other stuff? I don't think so. Because, as I've been saying, uh, the total all-electric market globally is hitting around the 2% mark. So 2% of all autos sold every year are, are some form of plug-in or hybrid or electric type approach. Uh, so that means 98% are not. <laughs> That's a big market in my books and any business to go after. I think there's tons of room for competition and the, also why I don't think that the Kona is going to impact a lot of other sales really is because I don't think still they're going to push out enough to meet demand. I'm hearing global production numbers of 20 to 30, maybe 40,000. I don't know yet. 
I hope they can crank out 100,000 plus, as I've said in previous shows. But that's what I'm hearing right now. So I don't think that's enough to really make a big difference in in changing sales. I think we still need the Bolt. We still need the, the other, the Ionic. We still need the other models. Again, the more choice, the more selection there is for consumers and to better fit their use cases in their daily lives. Some people don't want a, a bigger size car. They like smaller cars for their applications. Some want bigger and so forth. So I don't really think it'll make a negative impact to other models. There's lots of room for everybody to play in uh, in this marketplace, but that is a compelling price point. And if you have not thought about the Kona, you might want to start researching and check it out. And when, when I get Canadian pricing and some of the others, I'll certainly update folks with that. And on the update path, I got a quick email since I'm on their list as well from the Unity guys. Now, I was hoping to get out uh, back in mid-November to the UK or when I went to the UK, sorry, at the end of November, I was hoping to, to kind of slide over and go see the Unity folks in Silverstone. But unfortunately, where I was was just too far away and I just didn't have enough time to go over, do some filming and get back to where I needed to do within the within the, the, the schedule that I had. So unfortunately, I couldn't make it. But they were they were doing some kind of a press day. So it was it was the timing was perfect if I could have made it out. But I didn't. But, you know, they were kind enough to send me an email uh, on a couple of announcements for these guys. So these guys are serious. So they've got some some, some they're working with Deloitte and Touche now, um, oh, the big houses, uh, consulting firms. Their goal is to get about a million cars on the road in the next decade. So about 100,000 a year, 10 years, or do the math, however you want to split that up. But that's a pretty impressive goal for a company that's still relatively in startup mode, um, not even building cars yet for any production, but getting there. So working with Deloitte to look at a direct ownership or a subscription based model or both because I think their view is these cars are pretty small they're really nice looking they're more urbanish transport I don't know if I'd do a cross-country US trip or Canada trip as an example in this you have nothing to say you couldn't if, you, if there's enough charging stations why couldn't you however um, that's not what these cars are designed for. They're designed for urbanish in and out situations and that kind of stuff. Um, so their strategy is looking at maybe that there's a lot of people that live in urban cities that take transit and you know there are zip cars and all these car sharing services, but but they want to get into that game as well and maybe look at it, a subscription based service offering so that you can drive one of these around when you need it, pick it up and drop it off and so forth. So Deloitte and Tooth uh, Deloitte and Touche is helping them with their business model and strategy in looking at this. So stay tuned for more information. They've also come out with some insights on their battery pack because they were kind of tight-lipped about that, but they made some announcements. So they've confirmed that they are using the same batteries as in the Tesla Model 3, which means Panasonic is their supplier, which is good. It means Panasonic stock is going to go up even more by a little bit if you're playing that market. Uh, they are using the 21700 battery cells, the cylindrical cells in their packs. They have 192 cells per module, uh, and their packs are eight modules in size with a total voltage of 48 volts. Now, I d didn't see the kilowatt hour explanation of that. So if somebody can figure out the math on what they think, because I think it's well known what the 21700 energy densities are. And if you do the math on how many cells per module, 192 and 8 and, and 40 volts, if, you, if somebody could email me back what they think the kilowatt uh, hour size, uh, pack size is on that, I'd love to know. I'm guessing around 35 or so, because I think for an urban application, I don't know if you'd see more. But I didn't see anything in the information so far uh, and but I haven't scoured their website for a while yet either to to actually acknowledge the size of the pack. And uh, I will be going out to Silverstone next year for fully charged live version 2.0, which will be in the uh, early part of June in the UK. And I will meet up with Unity at that time and get more info. Volkswagen's come out with some new info as well. And, <laughs> and I know it's talk a lot about it, about Volkswagen, a lot of announcements. We need to see something more than announcements. But hey, you know, at least it keeps them in the news. Their ID Lounge, they kind of did some sneak peeks for, um, I believe it might have been at the LA Auto Show. I don't remember exactly about a, a fifth electric car in the ID family, which is called the Lounge. That's an internal name. So we don't know externally if that's going to be the same thing. Sorry, and they expect to actually unveil it, uh, unveil it at the Shanghai Auto Show in April of next year, 2019. Now, this is going to be, they, they expect it to be some sort of seven-seater, uh, more SUV-ish type electric vehicle, so to compete with the X and those kinds and the, maybe the I-Pace to a degree, but, but more of, of that type of stance and framework design. 
Um, that, so that's what they're they're hoping it's going to be. They're actually it, they've uh, related it to the Touareg sized. So their their current SUV, the Touareg, if I pronounce that right, um, it's going to be a premium seven seater uh, car. Uh, expected in 2021 and it's going to be on the maxed MEB platform remember all the ID family is going to be on that what they call the modular something something platform I forget what the EB's the modular electric battery I don't know platform uh, there's there's a probably a German name for that and it starts with the ID which is the cool little hatchback and then the ID cross which we've seen some pictures which is their sedan the lounge which is kind of an SUV ish something called the id aero e we don't know yet what's happening with that and then the id buzz which is the funky retro back to the to the vw van again and the vans from the 60s and 70s and so forth and that whole timeline goes from about 2019 to 2022 as far as releases of those different products plus or minus maybe a year shift depending on how fast vw can get them out so um the lounge here is based on that platform and it's going to be the, the biggest you know uh skin that they can put on that pl pl platform and the good cool thing about it is a 111 kilowatt battery pack which is the biggest in in the id concept specs that we've seen so far uh in a combination of dual uh, all-wheel drive with two 150 kilowatt motors on each axle uh to give them that and a range assumed at about 500 kilometers 300 miles 310 miles so similar to model 3 specs as far as range I'm guessing that that's WLTP specs, but it, the article didn't state that. So stay tuned. Again, as I've been saying all along with VW, the proof is in their pudding. Now, on that note, I got an email from a friend of mine a couple of days ago, uh, and then the article, I saw an article the next day on another website, but I'm, I'm referencing my friend's email here. Just there were some spy shots of a all electric VW car being tested in South Africa currently. Um, and here's a picture of it. Um, it, I don't know if it looks like it's the original ID uh, vehicle. It's hard to say with all the camo gear how things black out. And again, things can change when they're in pre-production and they're just doing road testing, most likely testing the drivetrain, the battery, and the charging uh, uh, characteristics and, and drivability and so forth. But, um, you know, what this means is that even with all these announcements now, it looks like VW, I mean, again, the proof is in the pudding. we got to start seeing something out there. Well, here's a great example of now we're seeing something out there where at least it's something's being road tested. It's all electric and the spy shots are starting to come out. So that's good. That means that VW is actually making some steps. They've been doing lots of announcements about spending billions on battery suppliers and retooling plants and all this kind of stuff and, and spending, looking at the long-term adoption of EV. And now we're seeing some proof to that where we start seeing their new, brand new. Again, the ID platform is an all-electric platform designed from the ground up for electric cars, not a e-golf where they, do you put an, a nice engine in it or do you put an EV um, powertrain in there um, that's your choice so good to see it uh, as keep watching the internet for more spy shots and hopefully we'll start seeing some announcements at the car shows next year i'm hoping to go to a couple of car shows i'll definitely be going to toronto in february and i might be going to another one prior to that but i'm not 100 percent sure yet so i'm waiting to get confirmation uh, and i'll tell you a little bit more about that later on but uh, keep your eyes on vw it's good to see something finally you know uh, the rubber hitting the road in reality there all right, folks, before I wrap up the show, uh, I want to tell you about something that I've started in the last couple of days. Um, I've been kicking this idea around for months uh, about doing a bit of a fundraiser. And these are things I'm going to try to do on a little bit more, or at least a, of an annual basis, if not a little bit more if I can. Uh, I'm trying to do some fundraising for local charities around uh, when I can. I want to have something, some, some, something to give away to help with the fundraising. So I started on Eventbrite a fundraiser for a Model 3 Frunk. That's the Frunk. Uh, it's a bag set, and it's done by a company called Oscar and Hamish. And um, here's the bag that the uh, the front set came in, and I'll show you that in a sec, the actual set. But this company, now, if you go back to my fully charged video back in June, you watch that, you'll see I do an interview with one of the gentlemen who runs that organization, uh, Julian, and he sh walks me through a Model S and a Model X gear. And he tell and I believe he showed me at that time a prototype for the Model 3 that he had brought to the show and talked about it. So these are these are um, custom fit bags that fit into the frunk and uh, they do others for the SNX that fit into parts of the trunk, different uh, cubby holes and things like this to put stuff in to maybe you know throw gym stuff and grab the bag and off you go and so forth. So custom fit for your Model 3, um, a couple of frunk bags. Now these bags 
I've got it in the plastic right now, so it may not show up so good with all the lights and everything. But uh, it's a set of two bags, and these are a carbon fiber type of material that he sent me. Um, a value of about 200 bucks US uh, when I do the conversion from pounds, because this is an English company. In the UK, they're, they're shipping stuff, so uh, or based, so that's what they charge in. Um, so he sent me these two front bags. Now, um, Trevor and I are going to get together in a few days at the end of this next week coming up. And uh, Trevor, we're going to do a quick review of this for the Model 3 and a Model X version. I don't have the Model X version. I just have the Model 3 version here. And that's what I'm giving away on this charity raffle, as I'll call it. So what I've done is I've used Eventbrite as the mechanism to... Uh, to collect the monies in and to, you know, you put your name and address and all that stuff in there like you're buying a ticket, but you're not really, it's not for an event, it's for a charity. It costs you five bucks. I believe Eventbrite charges a small fee to manage all that. I apologize for that, but I had to use something that was easy that uh, for some for something and safe, of course, from privacy, that would collect the money and deal with that and then pay me at the end. And, and all the funds that I receive from this campaign uh, with the exception of paying for shipping it. So wherever, whoever wins this, wherever they are in the world, I'm going to ship it to you. Whether it's Thailand or USA or Sweden, it doesn't matter. I'm going to ship it to you. So I'm going to, you know, whatever monies I collect, I'm going to take that shipping cost out and all the rest of it, 100% of that, will go towards the, the charity that I've picked is the uh, Sick Kids Foundation or Hospital for Sick Children. So the Sick Kids Foundation is the fundraising arm for the Hospital for Sick Children. And if you're not familiar with them, they're an outstanding children's hospital here in Toronto that do so much good stuff that I can't even, I could spend an entire hour talking about how good that, that um, organization is. Very dear and close to our heart from a personal perspective. So I wanted to give back and this is a way for me that I thought that I could do that. So check out the event, Bright. I'm going to have it in the show notes in the comments for the show, the link for that. Um, and I posted it up on my Twitter last night or, or already a little bit time ago. Uh, so I'll be starting so go out there spend five bucks whatever the plus the service fee buy your ticket and this i'm going to run this to the end of the year so uh, it because I, I i was traveling and i literally only got this trunk set two days ago i've been waiting for six months for this to come uh ever since i met julian back in june he agreed he was going to ship me one and they had delays and finally he was able to get me one so i i really folks only got it a couple of days ago so I put this uh, campaign, this fundraiser up uh, for charity, and um, I'm going to let it run till the end of December, till January 1st. And then at that time, I'm going to pick a winner. Um, I, I'm going to do it electronically using some sort of program, and then I'll, I'll announce the winner on my first show in January there and ship it out. Um, now, I'm also going to include some exclusive gear that you haven't seen before. Um, an EV Revolution Show coffee mug with the logo. Uh, pretty cool. This will look good on anybody's desk or on anybody's house uh, as you drink your nice cup of coffee or tea also i'm going to throw in a brand new hot off the press ev revolution ball cap so it's uh just kind of a standard ball cap it's got my logo and it's got ev revolution show on the back so hopefully one size fits all adjustable pretty cool uh just general ball cap that i'll throw in there and that you can uh, show that you're a supporter of the show so i'm going to throw those in with the carbon fiber front Truck uh, set, trunk set. That's a lot to say, as part of that. So I, I hope that you'll, you'll please um, contribute and and buy a ticket for the uh, for the charity raffle for these things. Even if you don't have a Model Three, you may, you probably good chance you may know somebody that's got a Model Three. It would make a great after Christmas present because unfortunately I just can't wrap up this. I don't have enough time to wrap everything up before Christmas. It's, it's only a, you know, a week away and I just got this stuff and I want to let it run for a couple of weeks to see if I can build up some funds. You know, I'm hoping to get as much as I can folks for this, you know, a few hundred dollars, a couple thousand, whatever I can get. Everything's, you know, as I said, except for the exception of uh, shipping costs are, is going to go to the Hospital for Sick Children or the Sick Kids Foundation. And that's that's the, the charitable arm for that. I put a nice description about what this is. This is version two of the front set as well. And again, Trevor and I are going to review that in a few days. Trevor will pop, push that up on the Model 3 Honors Club site and then you'll be able to visually see what it is. So, I'll, so I will have to take it out of this nice plastic packaging. But I'll package it real nice again and keep it clean. And then when uh, when it's ready to ship, I'll ship it all out with this cool EV Revolution gear. So thank you very much for listening to that ramble about my charity that I'm uh, raising some money for. And I hope, please, I hope that you'll contribute.
All right, and on that note, now the show is done. Thank you very much for tuning in. And as always, I welcome feedback, comments, suggestions, complaints. I don't know. You got something you want to get off your chest? Sure, what the heck. I'll put a nickel in the can and I'll listen to you for a while if anybody gets that reference. Send me an email at evrevolutionshow at gmail.com. Always love to hear you and get emails and comments. Thank you for people that do. It really means a lot to me to hear back from people. And, and of course, especially on the YouTube comments. On Twitter, um, I'm you know, get growing that slowly and, and seeing some activity there. Really appreciate you following me on Twitter. At evrevshow is my Twitter handle. You can follow my antics there and uh, see what stuff is going on. Uh, I follow quite a few EV-focused uh, organizations and some great news that comes out that I try to keep on top on to supplement the shows as well. You're watching this on YouTube, so thank you very much for that. If you have not subscribed, please do and click the bell as well. You'll get automatically notified when new shows come. That would be much appreciated, trying to get my subscriber count. My goal, folks, is to get my subscriber count up to 10,000. I'm at Somewhere last look around 4,500 and all the last couple of weeks have been a bit of a whirlwind for me with two international trips um, spanning a combination of 22 uh, of about 50 hours of flight time between them, uh, 45 hours of flight time between the traveling. So I'm still kind of bush from that trying to get back into the swing of things. Um, but um, certainly um, my goal is to try to get by the end of next year, if I can, maybe up to 10,000 subscribers. And the reason is, is because that gives me access to YouTube spaces and to a lot more help from YouTube for creators. There are different kind of levels that you can um, get assistance from YouTube on without having to pay for stuff. And if you get the 10,000 subscriber or more, then it gives you access to YouTube spaces. And now I'm fortunate that there is a YouTube location here in downtown Toronto, and I can go attend workshops and I can go networking and I can go utilize. And I, I do plan probably doing a show or two from their facility at some point. They've got a much nicer studio than I have here in the basement of my house. Um, and you know probably bring in some guests and that kind of stuff. So there's things I'd like to do and utilize YouTube um, for those reasons. So I, I need to get my subscriber count up. So if you have have not subscribed please do of course the audio podcast just pushed one up a little while ago again from the uk uh, if you have not seen those you can uh, use your podcast app if it's hooked into itunes or if it's hooked into google play or uh, you can use TuneIn radio you can use stitcher spotify so i'm on there and stitcher was the last one that i've been able to upload to, to get access to upload the podcast so please listen to the podcast keep them different a little bit more entertaining and i hope you enjoy those as well and finally as always 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 a big heart felt thank to my patreon supporters for helping me out um, a few dollars a month a dollar a month if you want whatever you want to contribute to that can help me it helps me to um, you know look at uh, more supplies and things like that that i need to do and set, offset some travel i am going to be doing some traveling next year as i mentioned i'm going to go to fully charged live in the uk there also is going to be a fully charged in the U.S. I don't know if it's been publicly announced yet where and when, so I can't say, but I do know it's when and where it is. Hopefully that announcement will come soon. I will be going down to attend that session as well next year. So there's a couple of trips that I have planned as a minimum next year. So all these kind of things cost and uh, uh, anything you can do to help defray it would be much appreciated. You go to www.patreon.com forward slash EV Revolution Show and check out my page there. And I again, thank you everyone as well. And on that note, that's it for this edition of the EV Revolution show. I'll, I'll definitely get one out before Christmas. So I'll do my Christmas show in a few days before the holidays. But up until then, thank you very much for watching this show. Everybody stay safe. And until next time, we'll see you then.